Amen. Well, of course, we've been in Revelation for many weeks now. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, this would be our 10th study in the book of Revelation. And I want to remind you that when we began the book a couple months ago, we talked about the fact that there are uh, different positions taken regarding the entire book, that there are some people who view the book from a historic point of view. They believe that everything in these chapters has already taken place in history, that there's no prophecy contained here. There's nothing that is yet future contained here. And then there are those who take a spiritual approach. And they also deny that there is anything prophetic in this book They simply spiritualize everything they read and seek to make some sort of personal application from that. And then there is the futurist approach. And the futurist believes that most everything in the book of Revelation is prophetic and that it is yet future, even for us, in the time in which we live. And I made it real clear on that first week, the position that I take, and that is the futurist position. I believe that beginning with Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, we are talking about events which are yet future. And so, also, we talked about the fact in the first week and again in the second, and we've really referenced it probably every week so far. In chapter 1, verse 19, if you look at it with me, Jesus' instructions to John were these. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So, Revelation is unique of the books of the Bible in that it gives us its own outline. And it divides the book into three portions. First, the things which you have seen, which is recorded for us in chapter 1. It was John's vision of the Lord. Secondly, the things which are. This is recorded for us in chapters 2 and 3 where Jesus Uh, dictated the seven letters to the seven churches. So, these were the things pertaining to the church. And then thirdly, the things which will take place after this, which begins with chapter 4, verse 1, and we'll come back to this a little bit later on in our message this evening. But I want to reiterate that that second section that we just finished last week is a section that deals with the church. And we talked... Over these seven weeks, we look at those seven churches about the fact that not only were those letters written to churches that existed at that time, but that each one successively represented a different period of church history. So that the last church that we looked at represents the period of church history that we live in today. We raised the question when we ended last week, what do you suppose the significance is of the fact that There is no eighth letter. That would indicate to us that something is going to change, that something very dramatic is going to take place because there there is no uh, church history here on earth given to us beyond the period of church history in, uh, in which we are currently living. So that does bring us up to chapter 4, verse 1. Now, originally it was my intention to study the entire fourth chapter tonight. And then sometime during this last week, I decided that we would only study the first verse tonight. And then sometime today, I decided that we would spend two weeks on the first verse. So our pace is going to slow down dramatically. And really, we're going to reference this verse tonight, and we're going to talk about it just a little bit here at the beginning and again at the end. And then we're going to come back again next week. And uh, I think that you'll find these two messages very, very helpful in terms of your understanding the things we're going to talk about, and particularly why I hold the position I do about these things. And of course, it's the position that most of you share. So Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. I'll read just the first several words of verse 2. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. Now, I believe that in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, we have the timing of the rapture of the church. Now, some people feel as if 
we have the rapture itself in this first verse. Others feel that we don't have the rapture itself, but that the verse makes it obvious that this is when the rapture would take place. That's really neither here nor there. What is important is understanding that, that I believe that it is right here in chapter 4, verse 1, that the church would be caught up to be with the Lord. Now, it may be that you have no idea what I'm talking about. I grew up in a church that did not believe in the rapture. I was confirmed as a boy growing up in the Lutheran church. I remember very specifically going through the confirmation classes. And I remember when we came to the study of prophecy, the pastor referring to Hal Lindsey and his teachings regarding the rapture. He told our class very straightforwardly that in his opinion there was no such thing as the rapture. And he went on to call Hal Lindsey a liar. Well, I believe there is such a thing as the rapture. I don't happen to believe that Hal Lindsey is a liar. And I want to share with you what the Bible teaches about the rapture of the church. So what we're going to do tonight is something that it's been about three years since we've done this together, which means that most of you weren't here for that. We're going to look at the key passages in the New Testament that talk about the rapture of the church. That's going to do a couple important things for you. Number one, it's going to help you understand what in the world we're talking about when we refer to the rapture. And maybe you know what the rapture is, but there's questions in your mind about the sequence of events and and what all is going to take place. And so hopefully this will answer some of your questions. As we look at those passages tonight, you will also see some of the reasons why I believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation as opposed to in the middle or as opposed to at the end. Next week, we'll follow up and give you many, many more reasons why it will happen before and not in the middle or after. Those are positions that honest Christians hold. We have people here at Calvary Chapel who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture. And that could be your position here tonight. And we respect you and we respect your position. I'm just going to share what my position is. I'm going to share what we believe as a corporate body and what you'll hear from the pulpit whenever this subject comes up. And I hope that even those who disagree with me will be challenged by the study. So let's begin by turning to the Gospel of John chapter 14. If you want to, you can leave your finger in Revelation, but it's going to be a while before we get back there, so your pages might start curling up. John chapter 14. Now, I believe that there is only one reference to the rapture of the church in the Gospels. Some people believe there are others. Some pre-tribulationists believe there are others. Many of those will point to Matthew chapter 24. And I believe they're confusing a reference to the second coming with a reference to the rapture. And it may be that next week we'll get to talk a little bit about that. My plan right now is Matthew 24 will be one of the things we glance at next week. But I believe that the only true reference we have to the rapture in the Gospels is found right here in John chapter 14 in the first few verses. Now you have to understand a little bit of background and then we'll look at these couple of verses before we move on. This is the night that Jesus will be arrested. He's gathered with his disciples in the upper room to observe the Passover. In chapter 13, verse 21, he predicts Judas's betrayal. In chapter 13, verse 33, he predicts his own removal. And in chapter 13, verse 38, he predicts Peter's denial. The disciples' hearts were troubled by all of that, as you might well imagine. And it was in this context that for the first time, Jesus revealed that before the second coming, Christians would be removed from the earth. Look at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, it's not likely that the disciples understood what Jesus was telling them. 
After all, they were still struggling to understand the differences between the first coming and the second coming, much less the differences between the rapture and the second coming. So this may well have been lost on its immediate audience, but it's not lost on us. Notice the difference between what Jesus describes here and what we know as the second coming of Christ. In verse 3, Jesus is coming to take Christians to heaven. And in the second coming, we have Jesus coming to earth to set up his kingdom. And so these are two very different events. And there are many more contrasts that can be made between them, uh, which we'll probably get to next week. But this would be the first reference to the rapture of the church. Now, if you'll turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And by the way, we're not looking at every reference to the rapture of the church, just those that would be considered kind of the key references. Some people think 1 Thessalonians was the first epistle Paul wrote. Others think it was Galatians, but probably more believe it was 1 Thessalonians, and at any rate, it was definitely one of his very first epistles. So we're taking uh, the things we learn about the rapture somewhat chronologically. The theme of the book and particularly of this passage, is the return of Christ, the rapture of the church. And uh, we'll be picking it up in chapter 4, verse 13. But it's interesting as we look at this passage, beginning with the first verse, it says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. It's unfortunate that this very subject about which Paul did not want Christians to be ignorant there is so much ignorance about. And as you read through the New Testament, particularly the Pauline epistles, you will see a number of times that he says he doesn't want his readers to be ignorant. And it would seem as if every time he says that, it is just such a subject. A subject that Christians are too unfamiliar with today. Now, the Thessalonians were concerned that those who had already died would miss out when the Lord returned for the church that because they had died before the rapture, that somehow they would miss out when the rapture took place. And in verse 14, Paul makes it clear that their spirit has already gone to be with the Lord. Those who have already died, they've died before the rapture, their spirit has gone to be with the Lord. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, Paul uses the word sleep as a euphemism for death. And so he's talking about those who have died. When Paul wrote the second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 5, verse 8, he said that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Christians don't believe in soul sleep. Christians don't believe that when a believer dies that, you know, they're just like a pair of eyeballs kind of floating around, you know, waiting for the rapture, waiting for the resurrection. The Christians believe that though the body is placed in the ground, the spirit, the soul of that individual goes immediately to be with the Lord. In verse 15, Paul makes it clear that though they have not received their new bodies yet, they will receive them. In fact, they will receive them immediately before we do. That is, those who are alive at the time of the rapture. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now, in order to explain to his readers how all of this would be possible, Paul takes them step by step through the sequence of events that we call the rapture in verses 16 and 17. Now, please understand, and you'll especially see this when we get to a passage in 1 Corinthians This takes place in an instant. So we're rolling the cameras at slow motion so that we can, you know, see what it is that transpires in that instant. Okay, so that's the way that we're going to do it. But but understanding that this is something that happens immediately. So verse 16, The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, notice, first of all, Paul tells us that the Lord himself will descend from heaven. What's cool about that is that he's not sending anyone else. But he's going to come. Jesus Christ himself is coming. And then notice that he comes with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Now, a shout refers to an order or to a command. The idea here is his command to the dead to rise to the believing dead, to those Christians who've died. We'll see that made very clear a little bit later on. An example of this would be when Jesus called Lazarus, when Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, Lazarus, of course, would die again. And his spirit is in heaven with the Lord. And he's waiting for the new body that we'll all receive at the rapture of the church. But remember that when Jesus raised Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth been pointed out many times that it's a good thing he said Lazarus. If he just said come forth, you know, everybody would have come cruising out of their graves. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the time of the rapture. Then it refers to the voice of an archangel. And this refers to Michael, the only archangel mentioned in the Bible. And so the idea here is possibly that of an angelic escort. It may also be that as Jesus gives the command that Michael repeats it. And then it talks about the trumpet of God, which is thought to refer to the voice of God and to speak even of the deity of Christ. Notice then it says that the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ. I alluded to this just a minute ago. This is a reference to church age believers. Very, very important to understand this. It's a reference to all of those saved from the day of Pentecost to the time of the rapture itself. The rapture of the church does not include Old Testament saints who will be resurrected after the tribulation, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. The rapture of the church obviously doesn't include those tribulation saints who will follow, but it includes the dead in Christ, church age believers. And then it says that we who are alive and remain, and it goes on, shall be caught up. Notice that Paul said we. Now that's kind of interesting because Paul's been dead for a long time. Paul obviously will not be among those who are alive and remain when this happens, but clearly he thought he would be. And this is important for a number of reasons. Paul believed that the rapture of the church would happen in his lifetime, as did the rest of the disciples. And we call that belief, the belief that the rapture could happen at any moment, the expectation that it will happen in our lifetime, the doctrine of imminency. The idea that the rapture could happen right now. The idea that there is nothing that must happen before the rapture can happen. Though the Bible is filled with prophecies regarding the second coming of Christ, many things have to happen before the second coming can happen. The second coming can't happen tonight. There are many things that have to happen first. But there is not one thing in the Scriptures that has to happen before the church can be raptured. So really, at all times, the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. It's the next thing. There's nothing that we're waiting for. There's nothing that has to happen before that can happen. That's why we say, we joke all the time, the rapture could happen before tonight's service is over. It really could, because nothing else has to happen first. And so, another thing that's important to point out here is this, that this doctrine of imminency, which goes all the way back to New Testament times, is only consistent with a pre-tribulational viewpoint. If you believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, then the rapture is always at least three and a half years away. We know that the tribulation, this seven-year period, will begin when the Antichrist signs a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel. Daniel chapter 9. We'll probably look at that next week too. And so, until that happens, you know you're three and a half years away. 
If you believe that the rapture is going to happen at the end of the tribulation, then the rapture is always at least seven years away. And so there is no doctrine of imminency, though people who hold those positions try to claim that they are maintaining that doctrine. They aren't. And instead of looking for Jesus Christ, you're looking for the Antichrist. I think that's the wrong place to be looking. I think our eyes are to be looking for the return of the Lord and not for anyone else. Now, it goes on to say that we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I want to point out something very important because when you talk about those Christians who do not believe in the rapture of the church at all, one of the points that they will make is that the word rapture is found nowhere in the Bible. Well, let me ask you tonight, how many of you believe in the Trinity? Would you raise your hand if you believe in the Trinity? Now, can any of you show me the word Trinity in the Bible? No, you can't. The word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Scriptures. But clearly, the doctrine of the triunity of God is taught from the first book of the Bible to the last. Now, the point there is obvious. Let me make another Whether or not you find the word rapture in your Bible all depends on what Bible you're reading. If you're reading the Latin Vulgate, you'll find that in this very verse, the word rapture appears. And so it definitely is a biblical concept, and it definitely is in the Bible. It's perhaps not in our English translation, but it caught up means the very same thing. And so it it really even is in our English translation. Now, notice also it says that we'll be caught up together. The word together is an adverb that means at the same time, at once. So the idea is that the dead in Christ and we who are alive and remain will get there at the same time. Though they'll start off just before us, we'll still get there at the same time. So maybe it's kind of the tortoise and the hare, I don't know. They're going to get a little bit of a head start, but we're going to get there together. And then the word is, with, excuse me, is a preposition denoting union. The idea here is that the dead in Christ and we who are alive and remain will get to the same place at the same time. So it's not like we're going to arrive at two different destinations at the same time, but we're going to arrive at the very same destination at the same time. We're going to party too, by the way. It's going to be a heavenly party. And then it talks about the fact that we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Now, as you read this verse, you would probably think that the word meet is a verb. It reads that way in the English. But in fact, the word is a noun. The reason this is important is because also the article the doesn't appear in the Greek. It says meet the Lord. So meet is a noun, the word the doesn't appear You could translate this phrase, the Lord's meeting. The idea is that this is the Lord's meeting, that He's planned it. And I love that. David Hawking points out that He is eagerly awaiting meeting you at that time in this meeting that He has planned. Then in verse 18, Paul, having addressed their concerns regarding those who have fallen asleep, tells them, to, verse 18, comfort one another with these words. So, just to kind of summarize, what is it that they were to find comforting? Well, the fact that in regards to those who have already died, their spirit is with the Lord. They too will receive their new body, in fact, immediately before we do, that will meet at the same time at the Lord's meeting, in the same place in the air, and together we will be with the Lord forever. So that is to be a great source of comfort. Now, still continuing in this passage, in chapter 5, Paul is speaking of the relationship of the rapture to a period of time known as the day of the Lord. Now, we need to define that term, the day of the Lord. And here again, there are different ideas, even among those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. But the phrase, the day of the Lord, does appear in the Old Testament on occasions when it does not refer to what we're talking about tonight. That's when it's used generally. And in that case, it's used to refer to any period of time that involves God's direct judgment on the world. 
But when it's used in a specific sense, as opposed to that general sense, the day of the Lord refers to all end times events, including both the tribulation and I believe the millennium as well. It's in these specific terms that Paul is using the phrase here as he writes to the Thessalonians. And so the question, what is the relationship of the rapture to the day of the Lord? Or, to put it another way, what is the relationship of the rapture to the tribulation and to the millennium, this thousand-year reign of Christ that will follow the tribulation? Well, in this fifth chapter, in verses 1 and 2, Paul indicates that the day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. Let's read those first two verses. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now, if the day of the Lord begins with the second coming, as some suggest, you have a number of problems. Most of those who suggest that the day of the Lord begins with the second coming do so because they want to avoid a pre-tribulation rapture. One problem is what to do with all of the Old Testament passages dealing with the day of the Lord that describe the tribulation. That's a big problem. Another problem is the fact that both the Old Testament and the New Testament speak so extensively about the second coming, and as I pointed out before, of the signs that will precede it, that it can hardly be described as coming as a thief in the night. In fact, based upon what we know in the Scriptures, if you were here during the tribulation you would at a certain point in time know three and a half years before the fact the exact day the second coming would take place. Because the Bible tells us about an event that we know as the abomination of desolation. We'll probably talk about it next week. And it tells us the exact number of days from that event to the second coming. So again, it could hardly be described as coming as a thief in the night if the day of the Lord began with the second coming. Only the rapture of the church could legitimately be described as coming as a thief in the night, at least the way Paul uses the phrase here. The Lord will be unseen by the world, and He will take from the world, like a thief, if you will, the entire church, and will return instantly to heaven. Now, to continue in our text, in verses 3 and 4, Paul indicates that the church will not see the beginning of the day of the Lord. Verse 3, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. They shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Now, if the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, why won't it overtake Christians as a thief? Well, among other things I might say, I'll say this. It's because they won't be here when it begins. How is it going to overtake you as a thief if you're not here? It can't, and it won't. In verses 5 to 8, Paul makes it clear that we are of a completely different day. This is important. Look at verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, the very phrase, the day of the Lord, only serves to remind us that there are other days. Otherwise, there would be no need to specify which day we're talking about. The day of the Lord, as opposed to any other day or days. When it says here, you are all sons of light and sons of the day, It's a reference to the day that precedes the day of the Lord, to the church age, the age in which we are now living. And then when it says we are not of the night nor of darkness, this is a reference to the beginning of the following day, which is the day of the Lord. Now, if the words night and darkness don't seem to be a very likely reference to a new day, specifically to the day of the Lord, then I would just ask you to consider the fact that when a new day begins, it begins with darkness. Particularly in Jewish thinking, where the day begins not at midnight, but at sundown. A new day always begins with darkness and then you know, blossoms into light. And so too, the day of the Lord, which begins with the darkness of the tribulation, will progress into the light of the millennium. Now, 
just in case anyone has missed any part of Paul's argument, Paul stops beating around the bush and he says it straight out, verses 9 through 11. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Folks, God did not appoint us to wrath. There are several other promises in the New Testament that say exactly the same thing. We'll reference more of them next week. But let's turn now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Having read 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul's readers understood Paul to be teaching that the rapture would precede the day of the Lord. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we discover that false teachers apparently the very first post-tribulationists who may have forged a letter from Paul, may have signed Paul's name to a letter that they themselves wrote, that they were saying that they were already in the tribulation and thus already in the day of the Lord. Look at verse 1 of Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, in verses 3 to 5, Paul gives the first of two reasons why they could not possibly be in the day of the Lord. So the first one, they could not possibly be in the day of the Lord because the Antichrist had not yet been revealed. Look at verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? This fifth verse tells us that when Paul was there in Thessalonica before he'd even written the first epistle, that he spent a great deal of time teaching them about the rapture of the church. And he brings that to their memory here in this second epistle. Now, we just read this passage which tells us that the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. It cannot be proven. I cannot be dogmatic about it. But there is the possibility, and that's all I'm asking you to consider, that there is the possibility that the phrase, the falling away, could refer to the rapture. Most people believe that it refers to apostasy. And that's true. It's true that the end times would be a time of apostasy, both before the rapture of the church and certainly during the tribulation. We know that from our study last week when we talked about the final phase of church history. And we certainly will learn that as we study the book of Revelation about the tribulation period itself. And probably as many pre-tribulationists believe that it refers to apostasy as believe it refers to the rapture, maybe even more. But there is the possibility that it refers to the rapture of the church. The Greek word comes from a root, which is most commonly translated depart. And Dr. Wiest translates this word departure so that this verse then might be translated, that day will not come unless the rapture comes first. And I told you already, I can't be dogmatic about it. So you can throw that one out if you want to. You know what I mean? In other words, if you're really not too sure about what I'm sharing tonight and you think that point is especially shaky, that's cool, man. We can live without that point. You can just toss that point. We don't need it. It's not essential to the argument. In verses 6 through 12, Paul gives the second of two reasons why they couldn't possibly be in the day of the Lord. They couldn't possibly be in the day of the Lord because the Antichrist had not yet been revealed and the Antichrist cannot be revealed until he who now restrains is taken out of the way. Look at verse 6. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 
Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now the real question, if there is someone or something that is restraining the Antichrist and the Antichrist cannot be revealed until this restraining person or or thing is taken out of the way, then the most important question for us to answer is this. What is the identity of the restrainer? What is the identity of the restrainer? Well, let's look at the clues. First, the restrainer is a person. For Paul uses a personal pronoun. We know that much. Second, the restrainer is a masculine person or is revealed as a masculine person for the personal pronoun Paul uses is a masculine personal pronoun. So this begs the question, can anyone think of a person, a masculine person, who restrains sin? Let me rephrase that to make it a little bit easier for you. Can anyone think of a person, a masculine person, other than the Holy Spirit who restrains sin. And then another question. Can anyone think of an event in the end times that is going to significantly change the work of the Holy Spirit in the world? I'll rephrase that one too to make it a little bit easier. Can anyone think of an event in the end times other than the rapture that is going to significantly change the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. Folks, the day of the Lord cannot begin until the Antichrist has been revealed and the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of the picture by which we do not mean that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed from the world. After all, He's omnipresent. But we mean that His work through the church is going to be removed because the church is going to be removed. And so we see that the rapture of the church must take place before the Antichrist can be revealed and therefore before the day of the Lord can begin, before the tribulation can begin. Now, remember, we talked about the phrase the falling away in verse 3. We said it may not refer to the rapture and that it might not be accurate to translate the verse. The day will not come unless the rapture comes first. But that is exactly what verses 1 through 12 taken together teaches exactly what these 12 verses teach. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse 51. Now the Corinthians' concern was just the opposite of the Thessalonians' concern. While the Thessalonians were concerned that those who had already died when the Lord returns, will miss out. The Corinthians were concerned that those who are alive when the Lord returns will miss out. And so in verse 51, Paul makes it clear that that is not the case. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Some people think we should put that over the door of the nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What Paul was really saying is this, that even those Christians who have not died at the time of the rapture will be given new bodies. So if the rapture happens in our lifetime, as we saw earlier, though those who have died already receive their new bodies immediately before us, we too will be caught up from the earth. We will receive our new bodies. There will be a direct relationship between the old body and the new. The old will be transformed into the new. This new spiritual body, this glorified body that's suited for eternity. And we'll receive it at that time. In verses 52 and 53, Paul gives us even more details. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, the word moment refers to that which cannot be cut in two or divided, that which is indivisible. And so the idea is that this change will occur in the smallest conceivable amount of time. We alluded to that earlier. The word twinkling refers to any rapid movement and the twinkling of an eye is thought to be the quickest human response. So again, this speaks to the rapidity with which these events will take place. Now, did you notice that phrase, the last trumpet? We read it a moment ago in these verses, the last trumpet. The last trumpet has been confused by some with the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11. Now, in due time, the rate we're going, it could be a long time, we'll get to Revelation chapter 11. And we will learn about the seven trumpets and those judgments associated with them. But those who confuse the reference to the last trumpet with the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11, this has led them to believe that the rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation or at the end of the tribulation, depending upon how they understand the chronology of the book of Revelation. Now, obviously, I don't believe this reference to the last trumpet has anything at all to do with the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11. Let me tell you why. Keep in mind that you're going to learn a lot more about how Paul intended 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 to be understood from studying 1 Corinthians 15 than you are by studying Revelation chapter 11. You need to study the context in which the verse appears. 1 Corinthians 15 is the context of 1 Corinthians 15:52, and not Revelation 11, which was actually written by John many years later. And so it was certainly not in Paul's mind as he wrote the verse. Now, you'll notice in 1 Corinthians 15, if you glance back at verse 45, Christ is referred to as the last Adam, though obviously many men have lived since Christ. And you'll notice in verse 47 that Christ is referred to as the second man. Though obviously many men lived in between Adam and Christ. So this clues us into something. That perhaps the word last here should be understood not so much in terms of sequence, but in terms of significance. It's not a reference to the last trumpet that will ever be blown. Which, by the way, is not the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11 anyway. Something that many of those who make that argument don't realize. But the last trumpet, as it's referred to here by Paul, will signal the end of the church age. That's the significance of it. That's why it's called the last trumpet. It will signify the end of the church age. Now, I want you to go ahead and turn in your, turn in your Bible back to where we started, which is the book of Revelation. Maybe you've been brave and kept your finger there. You can't bend it now, but you'll find your place quicker than the rest of us. Revelation. And let's look again at this fourth chapter, verse 1. After these things I look, looked, and behold a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Now, is it just me, or does that sound a whole lot like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15? I mean, the parallels are really obvious. And so I don't think that it's misguided at all to think that we find the rapture of the church in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. Remember, at the beginning of our study tonight, we talked about the outline of the book found in chapter 19. The third category, which begins in chapter 4, was referred to as the things which will take place after this. The Greek is metatauta. The things that will take place metatauta, after this. When you get to chapter 4, verse 1, it says, metatauta, after these things I looked. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place metatauta, after this. It makes it so very obvious to us that number one, this is where the third division of the book begins. Because we have the Greek word in verse 19 used twice in chapter 4 verse 1 
to send off red lights for us so that we wouldn't miss it. But what's also interesting about that is the emphasis that it places upon chronology. After these things. After what things? Again, what did we say chapter 2 and 3 was? Chapter 2 and 3 was the things pertaining to the church. Significantly, again, in those seven letters, we have a panoramic view of all of church history from its beginning to its end. After these things. And as we continue in our study of the book of Revelation, we make some amazing discoveries. Some amazing discoveries. We discover that once we leave chapter 3, there are no references in the book of Revelation to the church on the earth until you get to the very end of the book. In chapters 4 and 5, you have references to the church in heaven. In chapter 19, you have a reference to the church coming back with Christ in the second coming. In fact, the word church appears 20 times in the book of Revelation, 19 times in the first three chapters. The final appearance, the last appearance, and the only appearance outside of the first three chapters comes in the last chapter. And something else that I think is definitely significant, and that is, you'll recall that when we studied chapters 2 and 3, each letter contained an expression. And that expression read like this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You find it in chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 29, chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 13, and chapter 3, verse 22. Now you find an expression like this only one more time in the book of Revelation. I'd like you to see it. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. What's missing? What the Spirit says to the churches. And that is for the simple reason that the church is in heaven with the Lord. The church is not on the earth as the events that are described in these chapters, chapters 6 through 18, uh, which describe for us, and into 19, the tribulation, the church is not even in view. We're in heaven, celebrating the marriage feast, receiving reward, having an incredible time of fellowship with the Lord and with one another, and waiting for that moment when we're going to come back with Him in the second coming, when He's going to put an end to this whole mess, when He's going to set up His kingdom here on earth, He's going to reign right there in the city of Jerusalem for a thousand years just as God promised the Jewish people in the Old Testament. The Scriptures say that you and I as church age believers are going to have areas of responsibility commensurate with our faithful Christian service in this life. That we're going to serve. We're going to have positions of service reigning with Him in His millennial kingdom. What an honor. What a privilege. What a thing to get excited about. What a thing to be comforted by. And what a thing to compel us to faithful Christian service and to holy living. Now next week when we pick up again with verse 1, you'll find that I have at least as much to say as I did tonight. Which is why even though we're wrapping up several minutes early, there's no way I could have given you the rest of what I wanted to give you. But I hope that you'll take the things we looked at tonight Go over them again in your own. Perhaps you'll get a tape and listen to it a second or third time. Really get these things ingrained in your mind so that you have a handle on them. And then the things that we'll give you next week will just shore up what you believe and why you believe it when it comes to the rapture of the church and uh, these things pertaining to the end times. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank You so much that it's Your plan to come back for us at any moment. 
Lord, that You're not going to leave us here during the tribulation, that You've got things You want to accomplish during that time that don't include us here on earth. And You've got things You want to accomplish during that time in heaven that do include us. We just thank You and praise You that we're going to be there for that. Lord, as we think about Your plan, we can't help but get excited. And, and I just pray, Lord, that as we look at the events in the world around us, as we consider the rebirth of the nation Israel, and as we consider uh, the Israeli people regaining control of Jerusalem, and as we look at all of the other prophetic things that have fallen into place and continue to fall into place, Lord, may we understand that that if those things indicate that the second coming is near, and if we know that the rapture precedes the second coming by at least seven years, then we are so very close to Your return for us. Lord, help that truth to grip our hearts, to impact our lives. We pray, Lord, that the desire of our heart given to us by You would be not to go sit on a hill somewhere and wait, but to occupy until You come. To take as many with us as we possibly can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.